Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast, The Land Between the Meadows. I'm here with Mr. Pope on a cold day in Crab Orchard again. Uh, we've had a lot of cold days, and it's kind of getting warming up, or not, it's not warming up to us. Yeah. But uh, I the, tell you, you've been inside today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're back, and uh, we hope everybody had a good Christmas and a good New Year's. Um, I know uh, it's been a while since we've been able to record since before Christmas. So That's right. We're uh, back at it, and hopefully uh, uh, things are good your way if you're listening to us. Absolutely. You know, this uh, pandemic has allowed us to be at home a lot more, and it's great for reading and the cold weather mm-hmm. outside. And mm-hmm. and uh, I've read some good books, yeah. not necessarily about Kentucky, some about Neanderthals and, and uh, Europe and and uh, early, the earliest of humans, <laughs> that I enjoy all that, and of course, Kentucky history. Mm-hmm. And that that, that kind of sets us up too for what we're going to talk about today. As far as like books go, I, and real quickly, I guess this might be off topic. Um, oh. You know. <laughs> oh, heaven forbid! <laughs> uh, you know, we've got we've had a lot of uh, uh, good comments about the us talking about Goebel and the, the all yeah, that. Yeah, um, that was fun. It was, and uh, you know, we're not done yet. I got a book. My really? mom got me a book about the oh, wow. uh, Goebel assassination. So some more reading I'm gonna have to do, and we will revisit. My revisit. children got me some books on history too mm-hmm. to read uh, over Christmas. Mm-hmm. So that was my Christmas present. Yeah. It's uh, always a good one. Yeah, I've only had more time to read them all. Right. You know, um, today we're going to be talking about Simon Gertie. Mm -hmm. And some people say, you know, well, the traitor Simon Gertie. Uh, But, you know, it's really interesting for those of you who know very much about Simon Gertie, um, the way that history looks at people and Mm -hmm. characters. And we've kind of talked about this, touched on it before. But Simon Gertie, was, was he a British person? Was he American, as in the United States, United Colonies? Was he a Seneca Indian, or was he all of those things? And he had the most interesting life, and historians love to kind of talk about him and interpret you know, his life and make some sort of judgment on it. But the circumstances of his life are, are, are quite interesting. He was, for those of you who don't know him, again, one of the great references, and I know you talked about it earlier, is the frontiersman um, uh, that mentions, you know, a story about Simon Kenton and Tecumseh. But Simon Gertie plays a tremendous part in that in that story. And, of course, he saved uh, uh, Simon Kenton's life, who is, you know, like the Kentucky hero of the pioneer days. Um, but... Gertie was born, let me tell you just a little bit about him. I'll kind of summarize. He was born in 1741 uh, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And his family, when he was about 13 years old, something like that, maybe 14, they were, they were afraid of, uh, of the French uh, because it was the French and Indian War, which many historians will say is the First World War. And that was a war between Britain and France on American soil. So the later colonies people were, you know, involved in that. George yeah. Washington, you know, that was his first, you know, act. You know, he's actually started the war. <laughs> I think we've talked about that before by by uh, attacking some British soldiers and killing them. <laughs> uh, but in the, in the French and Indian War, uh, they attacked a fort, which later became Fort Pitt. Mm-hmm. The French did. And, and, and Gertie's family, mother and father, had moved into the fort for security, which was often the case not only in Pennsylvania but also in Kentucky. We've talked about Fort Herod and Fort Logan, Fort Boonesboro. All those were families gathered and then were attacked by Indians. The French overcame the British, burned the fort down, <clears throat> captured Gertie's father and tortured him to death. Gertie was about 14 years old, and they took him as a captain, this Seneca and Delaware Indians were working together, I think, yeah. you know, uh, in the attack with, with the French. That's why we called it the French and Indian War. And they, they took Gertie and adopted him. So he, he's adopted and becomes an Indian uh, when he's like 14, 15 years old. And he really relishes it. He really does well. He's kind of like Simon Kenton. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, he thinks of himself as a Native American. Um, and, and, that, and that also leads into this historical, philosophical uh, 
discussion. Is, is Simon Gertie then, is he an Indian? Is he a Native American? He looks like one. He acts like one. He believes he is. Mm-hmm. Or, or is he a British? Yeah. So to kind of make a, an interesting story a little shorter, um, uh, Simon Kenton uh, later on becomes an interpreter for the Americans and for the British, um, uh, both, and at, at different times in his life. And he, he becomes, uh, he, you know, the Revolutionary War appears and da-da-da-da-da. And, and one of the things that uh, the Americans distrust him, even though he's a guide and interpreter, he works with Simon Kenton, uh, they believe that he's a traitor. And at what became Fort Pitt, they, they tried him for treason. And this really affected his life. And Simon Kenton was one of the people that was with him because they were scouts together. And um, he's acquitted, but he he quits, you know, serving them and goes off and and lives with the Indians and becomes very, very popular with them. Um, He and Kenton, I want to take just a few minutes, uh, become close allies and friends. And later on, uh, Simon Kenton, no, Simon Gertie, both of them are Simon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're going to be—it's going to be a tough day. No. <laughs> so, saves Simon Kenton's life mm-hmm. when they're going to burn Simon Kenton at the stake. Yeah. And one of the things they, they historians talk about Simon Gertie said, you know, he killed. You know, he was a heck of a fighter, and he just killed people unmercifully. Mm-hmm. You know, white people. You know, as an Indian, uh, and uh, this Crawford fella. Colonel Crawford, who was horribly burned at the stake. Um, Simon Gertie did nothing to put him out of his misery. Um, just, just watched him burn. Wa- watched him burn. Yeah. And he really couldn't, but he's criticized for that. So they call him a traitor, and, you know, he's one like one of the worst people. But I want to go back, and I want to read an excerpt, if I could, from uh, The Frontiersman by Alan W. Eckert. Uh, where he talks about Kenton and Gertie were out on a, a mission. They were scouts for the military, and they were in a cave at night, and they decide early on to become blood brothers. Yeah. Okay? I, I may have to kind of skip around because I don't want to do a lot of time reading. So one night, uh, as Kenton and Gertie were resting in a small cave along the Muskegon, Gertie suggested that the two of them bond themselves together in brotherhood in a sacred rite he had learned with the Senecas. What it meant, he explained, was that their blood became one, and they were brothers and would vow to forever help and protect one another at all times, regardless of the risk. There there weren't many people a man could depend on in this country, he added, and it would be good to know that there was at least one. Now, this is important because later on, Mm -hmm, (laughs) we'll see. Simon agreed readily, and Gertie, with shallow flicks of his knife, laid open his own and Simon Kenton's right wrist. They then gripped each other's forearms so that the incisions met and pressed tightly together and their blood mingled. The grip was held for several minutes, during which first Gertie and then Kenton swore eternal friendship, brotherhood, devotion, and protection, one for the other, as long as they both should live. It was a solemn and impressive ritual, and the youth felt a great warmth for his companion. He hoped one day to be able to prove the strength of his bond. Yet even though he trusted Gertie implicitly and felt great friendship for him, he could not bring himself to reveal that his name was Kenton, not Butler. The threat of the noose was still too distinct a reality for carelessness. Now, we've talked about this on this pod show mm-hmm. before when we talked about Simon Kenton and how he left Virginia thinking that he had killed a man, mm-hmm. got in a fight over a woman, of course, and, uh, you know, headed for the Kentucky frontier. That's what brought him there. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was afraid that uh, he had committed murder, which the guy never even died, and yeah. it was probably his fault in the first place. Yeah. He ended up moving, with, moving to where Simon Kenton was in Kentucky. That's right. Him. Yeah, that's oddly right. enough. But. Yeah, that's right. And they, they met each other. And uh, he got, well, you don't know if they met each other, but they got word that mm-hmm. the man was not Alive. dead. Yeah. Uh, so Simon Kenton, you know, becomes a great uh, explorer and fighter and savior of uh, 
uh, Fort Herod for one, Logan, and, uh, Fort, Logan, Logan Fort Logan uh, was yeah. important in Boonesboro and so forth. Um, you know, one of the greatest and most interesting pioneers, incredible human being, incredible athlete who could run and fight and was wise and beyond his years and saved, you know, countless numbers of immigrants coming in, sold them land and lived in the northern Kentucky around uh, Blue Licks and everywhere up in there. It's where he lived up at uh, Washington, Kentucky. You know, is everything's named for him and he explored every river in between. You know, he would jog, from, it would take us, you know, a day to drive. He would jog in a few hours between uh, Boonesboro and, say, Harrodsburg uh, through the wilderness. He was an incredible runner and could outrun people and was a dead shot on a run. You know, he could load and fire his long rifle on a dead run with and just accuracy that was unbelievable without even skipping his space. Pace. You know, the Indian said he was a man whose gun was... Never unloaded? Never unloaded. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to go. We're going to go fast forward a little bit to October the fourteenth, seventeen seventy-eight, and Simon Kenton has been captured. And he's just like this great coup, you know, that the the, the, the Shawnee have, have yeah. got him. They're very excited because oh, he was a big. I mean, he was oh, a big target. He's for big him. fish. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a big fish in the pond, and so you know they've decided they've, they've blacked his face and his arms, and they're going to burn him at the stake. Mm -hmm. So. I may skip around here a little bit. It said, one hour before dawn, Simon Kenton was roused from his fitful sleep and marched into the council house in which five different fires were burning to dispel the chill of the night. Already more than half a thousand warriors, imagine that, had gathered inside, and yet this giant Miskamiki, there was room for easily twice that many more. Um, it was built of split poles standing upright, to a height of nearly 16 feet, was both outside and inside and covered with fitting pieces of bark to act as insulation. The building was easily 75 feet wide, twice in length, and covered with a flat roof. Simon recognized few of the Shawnees, another Indian assembled, the blue jacket he saw at once, sitting with his own people near the door. Further inside, he recognized Bonan near him, black beard and black hoof, a British-looking Indian with a hideous scar down the left cheek, and the ear on that side of his head missing <laughs> to be the well-known <laughs> Delaware chief, Buck and Jilla. Close by him was the chief of the Kispatothica Shawnees, the Shamati Black Snake, and at the center of the room, Blackfish and Malatha, and off to one side of them was Malatha's son, Young King, and the son of the Puckensaw, Chik Chikaska. So, you know, here's the scene. Simon's shirt was removed, and once again, his face and arms and upper body were painted black, you know, and then the talk began and so forth and so forth. And, you know, Simon Kenton's not feeling lucky at all, uh, you know, and it goes on. It says a short man with paint on his face was finishing off his recounting of the expedition, you know, bragging about it. And there was something, uh, you know, at least 20 whites had been slain, he said proudly, and perhaps many more. No Indians had been wounded. There was something strangely familiar about the speaker, and Simon studied him carefully across the dimness. Suddenly, his eyes widened with the tremendous shock of recognition. Mm -hmm. Simon Gertie. When his report was finished, Gertie stepped through the crowd to see the important prisoner, quote-unquote who stood there along the wall, all blackened with the mark of the katatafa, that means death, a sign of his recognition on his part, Gertie threw his blanket to the floor and sat down upon it. To the prisoner, he said in English, sit down. When Simon did not immediately obey, Gertie jerked his arm and half threw him through the blanket. You were from south of the Ohio River. Kenton nodded. Gertie continued the questioning. What is your name? Simon smiled tightly. I never thought to see the day when Simon Gertie would fail to recognize his own blood brother. Mm. Gertie started and gripped the blackened arm and stared into the eyes. Who is it? The man who spied beside you at Fort Pitt and Point Pleasant and in between. Don't you remember Simon Butler? Butler! There was an instant of disbelief and then Gertie saw that it was indeed his good friend, and he hugged him fiercely, and tears came to his eyes. He talked to him rapidly, and then listened carefully as Simon explained what had happened since his capture 
Then he jumped to his feet and pulled Kenton up beside him. My brothers, he said, silencing the scattered mumbling in the room. All eyes turned to him, and when he had their attention, he placed an arm around Simon and spoke earnestly. My brothers, this is Katahotha, must not be killed. This is my friend. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Saved his bacon, man. It is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, and to think what, what, what would have been different if he didn't recognize right. him or didn't, right. you know. Right, uh, that, Like you said, that blood oath. Yes. Many moons ago, really came in, came in handy. Mm-hmm. And you know, we start to—I well, I know we're kind of talking about Simon Gertie's character, but I mean, this right, that one stands is a pretty solid thing to say. You know, even though he, Simon Kenton, was going to be burned at the stake, he still stood by his oath for him. You know. Mm-hmm. But go ahead. So you know, I mean, you know, here he is. You know, he's doing good things. He stood by his oath, as you said, and and. Uh, and uh, Simon Gertie saved his bacon. And, uh, you know, but many of the people that, that look at um, Simon Gertie, you know, they talk about what a traitor and the, this horrible burning of the stake mm-hmm. of Colonel Crawford. Yeah. Crawford, who had attacked, you know, a, a few days before and literally murdered women and children, about 60 of them, uh, in an Indian village. The Indians were just furious with him, and 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 they, they had uh, uh, captured Crawford, and uh, they wanted the worst punishment possible for what he had done, uh, and they they burned him at stake. And Simon Gertie was there, and and uh, Gertie had told him that if he if he gets a chance while he's burning at the stake, mm-hmm. and you know they're going to extreme pain, that he would he would shoot him, he would kill yeah. him while he was burning to save some of the torture, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, I guess Colonel Crawford was also hoping that maybe he'd get him off too, you know. <laughs> but that wasn't going to happen because they were so angry, Gertie said, that um, they would kill him uh, too yeah. if he tried to uh, free this prisoner because mm-hmm. they had a little yeah. bit of hate going on. Yeah. Um, and so here, here's another excerpt um, from uh, the uh, Frontiersman uh, in June 12th, 1782, when Crawford uh, meets up with Simon Gertie. Uh, and he tells him, um, Crawford sent a man to see him, and in a few minutes he returned. He talks English, sir, the militiaman reported. They're bringing this Indian in. This is before Crawford's captured. And he asks for your name, says he wants to talk with you right away, but you're not to come nearer him than 20 steps. Crawford went at once alone, stopping at the required distance and trying to make out the features of the short figure in the flickering light. Colonel Crawford, the man called, do you know me? Crawford hesitated. I seem to have reckon, recollection of your voice, he admitted, but I can't see your face well enough, and, and those Indians' clothes you're wearing don't help. Do I know you? We, ser- we shared lodgings before, came the reply. My name is Simon Gertie. Gertie, the deserter and renegade. See, that's what they mm-hmm. think of him. How well Crawford knew him. They had once been very closely acquainted in, in those months before McDonald's campaign eight years ago. A surprise to meet you here, Gertie. What do you want? Gertie's voice lowered. The Indians think I've come here to tell you you're surrounded and to demand your surrender. I'll tell them you refuse. Crawford, if you don't surrender, the Indians plan to take you tomorrow. They're three times as strong as you are, and they'll cut you to pieces. Tonight, they really are surrounding you. When they move in, uh, when when the move is completed, uh, you'll hear some fire all around the ring. But there's a large marshy ground to the east of you. It isn't covered. I'll be, it'll be hard going, but you have no choice. Listen for the gap in the sound. When the firing goes around the ring, take your men and ride for that gap. It's your only chance. Why are you doing this, Gertie? Crawford demanded. Because they're kind of wounded. But Gertie mm-hmm. only threw down the white flag and disappeared back into the darkness. Crawford returned at once to his camp and called a meeting of the officers. So, you know, Gertie gives him a warning and tells him what to do, and they all talk about it, and they go, well, let's break into small groups and get out of Dodge, you know. <laughs> I believe this guy. Um, so one of Williamson's groups is split into nine parties uh, of 20 men each, uh, one of which led, and all, all nine groups set off in different directions, leaving Colonel Crawford and his weary main army. The, calcula- the calculated the Indian would follow the bigger prize and leave them alone. They were wrong. Mm-hmm. 
The seven of the small parties were followed and wiped out almost immediately. <laughs> and he goes on and said, toward later afternoon, Crawford suddenly discovered that his son, John Crawford, and his son-in-law, Major James uh, Harrion, and his two nephews, James Rose and Bill Crawford, were all missing. He had no way of knowing all four of them were already dead. Oh, wow. So he's like the last one. Yeah. Uh, a straggler came along uh, to the group, and it was Dr. Edward Knight. And they stayed together a little later, and they joined Lieutenant Timothy Downing. And Don, they were discovered by the Indians, okay, and Crawford and Knight were captured almost at once. Biggs and Ashley were killed, and Downing and the other men escaped. The arms of the captives were bound with rawhide halters placed around their necks, and they were led to, the Del to a Delaware and Wyandotte camp less than a mile from their own campsite. Here they found nine other prisoners and 17 Indians, and here they, they stayed the day. Okay, So the 10 prisoners were marched uh, to a main Delaware village. Okay, And then what follows next, and you know, I don't want to read too much, but it, it's part of the... Um, uh, you know, torture of Crawford and the interaction of Simon Gurdy, which is, you know, interconnected. And this is what people, historians, are so critical of. So at once, uh, nine of the prisoners, all but Crawford and Dr. Knight, were led to the edge of the village where they were unceremoniously tomahawked and scalped. <laughs> so it took them down to two. So that was it for them. Uh, so uh, Chief Pipe, you know, he... he uh, uh, you know, looks and talks to Gertie, and you know they have a have a uh, thing, and 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 uh, Crawford nods that he understands, and Gertie stayed it stayed away. But back then, one thing more, he said, the death they have in store for you is a very slow and painful one. If all hope becomes lost, I will do what I can to end your suffering more quickly. Crawford watched him walk away, not cheered by Gertie's final remark. He had little hope <laughs> where the <laughs> yeah didn't bring his spirits up. <laughs> That's right, trying to bring his spirits up where the English traders were concerned. There remained, in fact, only one real hope for him. So they stake him out and uh, they 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 torture him. And Gertie watches mm -hmm. and uh, Crawford cries out to him, you know, stop this. You know they. Time to a stick. They let the women and other men beat him half to death with stitches. Uh, he falls down. They take hot coals. The women bring hot coals on bark and put it on his mm -hmm. back. Um, they burn his feet off. They make him Gosh. get up and walk around. Uh, they burn him slowly. Mm -hmm. The uh, chief pipe comes up and scalps him. Oh, wow. He, he first lets him watch him scalp Dr. Knight, mm -hmm. the other guy that's captured, uh, and then kill him. At the stake, yeah, and then he takes his his scalp and beats him in the face with the bloody wow. scalp and says, "This is what you get for working with this man." You know, they're a little they're a little mm -hmm. hacked off, you know. <laughs> uh, and then the the women and in, in all come with witches and thorns and beat him half to death to the ground until his body's bloodied. Mm -hmm. And then they take hot coals and put it on him and burn him, you know, while he's screaming out and everything, and he's begging, and and basically. Chief Pipe tells Gertie, you know, I don't want to hear a word out of you. And yeah. if you say one thing, we're going to we're gonna scalp and kill you, too, yeah. so. because we're a little hacked off here. Yeah. And we don't want to have anyone tell us what to do because, mm -hmm. you know, this guy has got it. You know, they painted Crawford's face black just like they were going to do to Simon yeah. Kenton. You know, Crawford, you know, just suffers and eventually is killed, uh, burned to death, screaming out and everything else, you know, in pain. Uh, so... You know, that, that was Curdy's, but he, he really couldn't, Gertie's uh, situation with the Crawford death, he really couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And, yeah his uh, hands were kind of tied. That's know. right. They yeah. certainly were. I mean, what, what do you do when the chief says, if you do anything, we're going to kill you? You're going to kill you, too. And so. Yeah. But, you know, historians look at this and they go, well, he was a white guy. He was born white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think back in history. He was just a young boy, you know, living yeah. wild on the frontier, half Indian anyway. Mm -hmm. And then he was adopted by the Indian. They became his parents and were raised good to him, him and raised him up. Yeah. Just like a, the yellow jacket that's mentioned. In the yes, book. I can't think Blue of his, Jacket. Blue Jacket, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't think of his English name, but he, you know, he was right. the same kind of situation. He was mm -hmm. adopted in and you know, rose up to chief even. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that's... You know, kind of the, the story there, but you know, Gertie, you know, he helped the French and they, 
kind of mistreated him, just used him. He helped mm -hmm. the British, and they they tried him as a traitor, you know, because mm -hmm. they did, they were suspicious of him. You know, he, he was versatile. He could be an Indian, speak the languages. He knew French. He knew English. He knew, you know, all the Indian languages. Uh, he was obviously very intelligent. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was just an incredible human being. And, you know, people often wonder, you know, what happened to him? Well, he lived a ripe old age. Oh, yeah? Even though he was in all these fights and battles. Yeah. yeah. Battle of Fallen Timbers, you know, where Tecumseh was killed and this, that, and the other, with Mad Wayne and all that. He finally moved out of the United States once it became a country and mm -hmm. lived in Canada until mm -hmm. he died in 1811. He was born wow. in 1741. Wow. So, you know, he was like, what, 80 years old or more? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, lived a long life uh, and yet lived a wild one. Mm -hmm. Now, his, I mean, he was, a, he was with Kenton. Mm -hmm. uh, plenty of times, mm -hmm. and in, in and out of Kentucky, I would assume. Quite Absolutely, often. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess to make our Kentucky connection, um, but it is amazing how kind of wild of a life he probably, or he did live, mm -hmm. as far as you know, being being in all the different camps to say it that mm -hmm. way, and he was probably a very valuable, knowledgeable mm -hmm. person of all. He really uh, was all around. If you really want to know more about the American past and mm -hmm. what it was like in that era. Simon Kenton is one of the most interesting people Simon to study. Kenton, uh, and there's lots of, Simon, excuse me, Simon Gertie. Simon Kenton is too. <laughs> They're all intertwined. But Simon Gertie is uh, one of the most interesting because it really tells you about, you know, the different cultures and how they mm -hmm. interacted. And, you know, back then it was like a toss up. Well, who's going to, who's going to own this land? I mean, yeah. the Indians occupied yeah. it. The British were coming in. The French were coming in. They were all, mm -hmm. it was like a free for all yeah. fighting, you know, and, and where is your allegiance? Starts. The American Revolution, well, the French and Indian War and yeah. then the American Revolution. Uh, and then the wars with Native Americans, Pontiac's War and so forth. So, you know, he stood his ground and made a great deal of personal sacrifices of what he believed was the right thing. You know, mm -hmm. he did. Uh, all to protect a culture that wasn't his. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So think about that. And yeah. uh, uh, so he's a guy that uh, really deserves, I think, a lot of historical credit. Mm -hmm. When you really, you know, people in history say, oh, I'm for the Americans, so anybody that's against America, you know, is bad, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what about the British, you know? If, you know, if I'm for the British, you know. Anybody that, you know, goes against the British is bad. And they'd say, well, I'm a Native American, you know. Anyone that affects Native American, you know, is a, is a, is a traitor, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, gosh, this guy, he, you know, he did what he thought was right. Mm -hmm. And he did follow the course uh, of his own life. Uh, well, and he seems to me to be a man that was more or less, um, I'm, I'm going to take care of myself. First, mm -hmm. and not necessarily being beholden to, you know, whoever was in power at the mm -hmm. time. Um, and yeah. when and when he lived with the Indians, he learned more than just their um, language. Yeah, he learned their culture and their religion, and mm -hmm. he followed it. Yeah, you know, uh, he believed in it. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting too. Um, but you know, when the revolution came around, the American Revolution, he he sided at first with Washington's rebels. Mm -hmm. But he became to believe that Americans ultimately uh, uh, were taking the Native Americans' land. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was saying, this isn't just a fight. You're, you're doing this to take our land away from it, claim it as your own. Yeah. And that, that turned him off. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an Indian agent yeah. uh, and translator for the British as well. Uh, and he continued his loyalty to what they would say are the savages. Yeah. You know. Well, it's really easy to call him a traitor, too, and... and I mean, if somebody wants to call him a traitor, I don't. Mm -hmm. It's fine by me. Um, but to think, like he, you know, in, in your life in general, sometimes like you may join up on a cause, whatever it may be, and halfway through, you're like, "Well, this isn't really what I signed up for." Mm -hmm. And but that happens plenty of times in mm -hmm. in life and throughout history that people say, "You know what? This wasn't really what I signed up for." And yes, they may go to the other side and to the people's side that they were mm -hmm. originally on. They're a traitor, but yet. Um, you know, people have moral compasses and those, Absolutely. those change as well. And, you know, we refer to this to as war, the Revolutionary War, the French mm -hmm. Indian War, you know, all this, the Indian War. But what it was was a cultural conflict. Mm -hmm. And look at um, this as a cultural conflict. You're seeing that, you know, you know, as we said, Native Americans occupying the land, 
the French claiming it, the British claiming it, and and unable to settle their differences and live together in peace. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was cultural. Yeah, it was yeah. about religion. Mm-hmm. It was about um, you know politics. You know the crown. Mm-hmm. You know it's just like you know they called him bad. Uh, the British did. Because they said, well, you were born British, mm-hmm. you know, and, and yet you helped the French and the Indians. So you have turned on the British, your own family. Your family's British, your, yeah. your, your mother who was still alive. And, and, and you've turned on her becoming a Native American, yeah. you know, a savage, as they would say. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was really, he was drawn into the center of the largest cultural conflict in American okay. history. Yeah, I mean, I would almost even mm-hmm. definitely American history for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, where, where? So, um, and it's a you know Americans' expansion, westward expansion into yeah. native lands, is an incredibly complicated story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's the story of the New World and the clashing and uh, uh, obliterating of yeah. one culture and another yeah. for the another. Yeah, oh. and then you call him a traitor. <laughs> I mean, you know, wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, interesting guy. And is it, does he have any journals or anything like that? That it was like, like with like Simon Ken, like mm-hmm. he, he he couldn't. He didn't right. Write I don't think stuff. he did. It didn't. No, but there's lots of books written about yeah. him. Yeah, and he's a well documented person. Mm-hmm. That's. I mean, that's a he's an inter- interesting dude. Um, our uh, listener, one of our listeners, uh, Monica Shamel, she is the one who also took her southeastern Kentucky tour here through. Lincoln County and Rock yes, Castle and, yes. and Harrodsburg and uh, visited many historical places that we would suggest you do as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, she suggested us to talk about Simon Gertie. Great. And, um, Good idea. Yeah, Good yeah. suggestion. Yeah, Thank and, you. We appreciate suggestions. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's so interesting. You can't, and, and this tells you something, and, and this is true with everything, mm-hmm. is that you can't really isolate and talk about one period of history without talking about all. And yes, Simon Gertie, you it, yeah. know, as we've said, I don't mean to be redundant, but, you know, it's not about Native Americans, not just about. It's not just about British. It's not just about French. It's not about just about westward expansion mm-hmm. and colonialism. Yeah. You know, it's all these things are interacting together. Mm-hmm. And that's what history is mm-hmm. and how they interact. And when, when you look at, say, one particular person in mm-hmm. that, that right. time, it's... How they're surviving. Yes. You know, and Simon Gertie mm-hmm. obviously was a survivor. Mm-hmm. Some of his choices, you know, we, we probably wouldn't agree with. The British wouldn't agree with. The Americans wouldn't agree with. The Indians and, and, wouldn't agree with. Yeah. No, no, yeah. not well. It, but he, and that what, what makes him such an interesting person mm-hmm. is because it's his focus and he made decisions. He wasn't a traitor. He made decisions based on what he thought was right mm-hmm. and based on the circumstances that he found himself in. Yeah. Yeah. So... Interesting. Uh, I mean, it'd take a complete idiot to say, <laughs> you know, the Americans were right, you know, yeah, yeah. the British were wrong, or, or even, you know, the Americans were right and the Indians were all wrong, mm-hmm. and the savages, you know, and to call them names and stuff. It's, it's, I mean, it, it just shows a lack of, of uh, historical yeah, ignorance. Yeah. 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 It's so much more complex than just it's saying. It's much more complex. Yeah, than you want to... And, and studying his life just leads us in an open door into that complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Whose yeah. side were you yeah. on? Who are you a spy for? Who, yeah, who was yeah. whose side are you on? Well, yeah. I mean, that happened two hundred some years ago. He said, I just want to live and be left alone. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. You know, I don't want my daddy tortured. And I don't <laughs> want my friends, the Indians, yeah. that, that took me in as a child. Instead of killing mm-hmm. me, they let me live and gave me everything they had and taught me their religion, yeah. which I believe in. And yeah. Da 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 da, mm-hmm. and you French are no better than the British, and the British are no better than the French, and all you want to do is just take the Indians' land. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, steal it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, come on, man. Yeah, wild, uh, a wild, wild, wild time, life, man. Yeah, wild yeah. time. Um, Interesting. We'll we'll plug the book again. I know we've talked a lot about the frontiersman, and, yes. and we probably just need to do a Patreon episode of just talking about the frontiersman because yeah. it's a it's a really good book. Oh, it's and the best. You can get it on. I have to do audible books because I have young know, kids and my. Hands are tied often, yeah, uh, but you can get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can ransom get, a red chief. <laughs> yeah. You can get a, a, the book on Audible if you prefer that on a good long drive, or just pick it up at a, a store, local bookstore, and uh, get it that way as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, I guess that's about it. Um, give us a good review on the iTunes if you can. Um, 
And thanks again to Monica for suggesting it. Um, yes. Feel free to make suggestions. We can't always get to every topic that's suggested, right. but we will try to at some point. That was uh, a good one. That was. Really yeah. a good one for us to and, talk about. You know, I love talking about history and thinking about it. And, and really connects to Simon Kenton, Daniel Boone, just that time period, which we've kind of covered pretty well, pretty mm-hmm. well in depth, in depth mm-hmm. at this point. Um, like I said, though, uh, we will have some uh, global stuff come in. It'll probably take me a, a while to read read the book, but in a while. Mm-hmm. And we'll get some more Kentucky yeah. history coming your way. All right. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you. Bye.